there to make your presentation? I am. Take it away. All right, fantastic. So, well, good evening from uh, Brussels first, and uh, thank you for having me, and uh, congratulations for putting this uh, event uh, together in spite of, uh, well, unusual circumstances, let's say. So, um, I'm going to talk about the, yeah, core solution and uh, um, uh, on the next slide. Um, what you can see is that, uh, basically, if you go a little bit to the past, uh, in the open ocean, you already had some uh, greedy continuous uh, product, either from PCO2 or um, exchange at the air water interface. As early as, the, as the 2009, with the Takahashi paper, the upper right corner. And then, uh, as uh, uh, for instance, what uh, Peter Lanchusio did uh, when the SOCAT database uh, grew, uh, some uh, artificial neural network um, interpolation methods. While in the, at the same time, the coastal uh, estimate for the global CO2 things were still mostly a collection of local studies and local measurements. So um, over time, the data, the global database for PCO2 actually kept growing and there were more and more coastal uh, measurements. So on the next slide, um, you can see uh, on the left uh, the location and data density uh, of coastal data in uh, uh, the SOCA database and the LDO uh, database. And so uh, they started to really um, cover a pretty large fraction of the coastal ocean, although some big parts were still missing. And there were already millions of measurements. So the idea uh, was to apply the same method that was used for the open ocean to the coastal ocean. So basically, a two-step um, artificial uh, neural network uh, interpolation procedure. First, uh, self-organizing maps that create biogeochemical provinces, and then this uh, feed-forward network that basically fills the, fill the gap and produces uh, PCO2 uh, measurements. So we end up with the figure on the right, which is this uh, first uh, continuous uh, PCO2 uh, climatology. Uh, with um, uh, basically uh, a data um, of a special resolution of a quarter degree, which was one of the difference between the open ocean product because of the uh, smaller scale uh, spatial feature of the coastal ocean, uh, we decided to increase uh, the, the resolution. Also, a few um uh environmental predictors were included uh including uh sea ice for instance because a large fraction of the coastal ocean uh is uh, actually covered uh, at least seasonally uh in sea ice and so uh that was published in 2017 and so on the next slide um what uh, we did was uh, compare this data against the observation that we had so on the left, you have the residual uh, of the uh, PCO2 climatology compared to either the SOCAT or the LDO um, uh, data. And so what you can see is that uh, although overall the, 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 the results were not too bad, uh, there were some uh, regions uh, which uh, still had some uh, big uh, discrepancies. So on the right, you can see the different biogeochemical provinces that were created by the self-organizing maps. And so in uh, the table below, basically what you can see is that the regions for which the performance of the, the algorithm were the poorest were uh, mostly uh, high latitude regions or also regions where uh, the coverage in data was not so good, which is as you would expect. But still, in, relatively well monitored data, the, the, the performance of the coastal uh, climatology were, could be compared with that of the, the open ocean. So on the next slide, uh, once uh, you have that um, coastal climatology, and you also have this uh, open, um, uh, open ocean uh, PCO2 climatology, 
one of the things you want to do is well compare them so uh here basically what was done uh by uh, robert et al and by the way i uh, made a mistake on the year it's 2019 but uh the um, uh, calculation for the flux the co2 flux at the air water interface were made uh using the similar um, condition and uh, calculations for the coastal ocean and the open ocean and in the middle you can uh, see the latitudinal um, uh, evolution of the flux density basically so what you can see here is that uh well as you could expect you see the same type of latitudinal trend uh for the open ocean uh, which uh, is in blue and the coastal ocean which is in red uh, however the surface area distribution of both the coastal and the open ocean are very different so that results in uh, hot spots for uh, co2 sink or outgassing which are located at very different latitudes so that's uh, one of the reasons for instance why in spite of relatively similar uh, behavior from the coastal ocean uh, compared to the adjacent uh, open ocean uh, when you calculate uh, on average a flux density for the entire open ocean and the entire coastal ocean you have a more intense uh, co2 sink in the coastal ocean in fact the the fraction of the arctic shelves is uh, quite important in the total surface area of the coastal ocean so that's that's why uh, now next slide once you have an open ocean uh, PCO2 climatology and a coastal uh, climatology, uh, well, it's of course nice to uh, use them separately and compare them together, but it's even better to actually uh, merge them together and try to produce an integrated data product. So that's a work that uh, Peter Lanchester has been uh, leading and uh, submitted to uh, ESSD. So with any luck, uh, could pop up online uh, like sometime this week but so basically the idea was to uh, combine those uh, two data products to uh, uh, produce something that could be uh, really be some sort of integrated view of the of the ocean as a whole and uh, since the coastal ocean product was designed to be uh, a bit uh, wider than the usual definition of the coastal ocean there was an overlap area which allowed us to uh, basically uh, uh, combine both products on this uh, uh, overlap area and have something relatively uh, smooth and consistent uh, to present. So on the next slide, uh, what you can see on the left is actually uh, the this overlap area and the, the, the relative mismatch between the two products uh, in this overlap area. So as you can see, uh, the, the mismatch is only a few percent in uh, most uh, tropical and uh, uh, temperate regions. But uh, in uh, at high latitude, especially in the Arctic, you can have much higher uh, differences. Uh, although this, uh, something should be taken into account there is that uh, some of those parts are actually under sea ice so the the calculation at least for the coastal uh, um, algorithm under the sea ice uh, obviously we we don't really know what's happening so we are able to calculate something but uh, we, we we don't have a lot of uh, faith in those results on the right what you can see as well is uh, that uh, both those products are actually mostly uh, climatology so uh, you can see that uh, we um, try to compare how the uh, reproduce the seasonality in uh, different uh, regions of interest and uh, we um, we compare that with actual observations so uh, what you can see is that um, in a nutshell uh, the regions where you have uh, sufficient uh, data coverage uh, both uh, products uh, produce relatively similar um, seasonal patterns uh, and uh, are relatively uh, in agreement with uh, the, the data, although obviously it's not perfect everywhere. And in regions where you have a 
well, less good uh, data coverage, uh, the, the, it's much harder to, um, to capture the seasonality and you end up with relatively uh, uh, flat uh, uh, seasonal pattern. So, okay, my time is up. So I have just a few uh, words on the next slide. Uh, basically, uh, thanks to the increase of uh, uh, coastal observation, uh, there is now um, a data product, a PCO2 data product uh, comparable to those that exist on the open ocean. Uh, it has now been merged with an open oceanic product, uh, but there are still some regions uh, that uh, need uh, better constraint and more data. And uh, there's also the question of what happens under uh, sea ice or in the part where uh, the ice melts. So that's, that was it for me, and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Goulvain. Let's, let's go on to Ray Nader's talk, and we'll have some discussion at the end of the section. Hello, everyone. My name is Ray Najar. Um, I'm at Penn State University here, Central Pennsylvania. Hope everyone's doing well. I'm glad we're pushing forward with our work um, amid the uh, amid the crisis. Um, I'm going to be talking fairly generally about uh, carbon processes in the coastal zone. I'll tr try to be as comprehensive as possible as I can in, in a short amount of time. I do have a lot of text on my slides, it's just the way my presentation turned out. Um, and I think it was just the most efficient way for me to me to cover everything. Next slide, please. Let's, let's talk about what, what exactly we mean by the coastal zone and different people may define it differently. I would like to define it as tidal waters that are influenced by the presence of the coast. And uh, some key points here is that the landward boundary is fairly well defined as the head of tide. Seaward boundary is less clear with possible definitions based on distance from land, depth, and slope. So the coastal zone includes tidal wetlands, estuaries, and by most definitions, large river plumes, shelf waters, boundary currents, and upwelling regions. So to a first approximation, we might separate coastal waters into tidal wetlands, estuaries, shelf waters, and maybe slope waters. Next slide, please. So here's an example from the South Atlantic Bite from some of our work. Um, it, it shows, you can see the, uh, the river coming in there on the left-hand side, you have tidal fresh marsh. So fresh waters, tidal, tidal fresh waters are included in coastal waters, I would say. Then you have some salt marsh. Um, if it was further south, you could have some mangroves as well. Then you can see the, uh, the open waters of the estuary there kind of in gray, and then the shelf waters. And of course, we're not seeing the shelf break and shelf slope, which might be included. Next slide. So the coastal zone has some unique characteristics that are relevant for carbon cycling. There are high nutrient levels that results from riverine input, upwelling, and tidal mixing. It is high primary production, respiration, carbon export from the euphotic zone, and especially carbon burial. Um, vascular plants are a unique characteristic, or the importance of them are a unique characteristic of the coastal zone. That's tidal wetlands and, and seagrasses mostly. Um, there's a large impact of human activities on coastal waters, more so than the open ocean. There's a large climate change influence, for example, due to sea level rise. And these are very complex systems and it's due in part to the high spatial and temporal variability. Next slide, please. So some of the questions I, I hope we will address and we started to poke at already um, are uh, how exactly should the seaward boundary of the coastal zone be defined? How well are the world's estuaries and tidal wetlands mapped? For example, what is the area of each? And I'm going to focus on this a little bit later. How well is the coastal zone sampled for surface water PCO2? And Golvan gave us uh, an idea of that, at least for shelf, shelf waters. How well can we model the relative impacts of winds, currents, surfactants, turbidity, fetch on the gas transfer velocity in coastal waters? We already heard that it's important in, in op the open ocean, and I would say it's even more so in, in coastal waters. What role does the coastal zone play and the natural outgassing of CO2 that, that Laura um, has already talked about and we've referred to several times. Next slide. Here are some questions about the carbon budget of the coastal zone that I think are relevant to, to our investigation here. What is the total carbon budget of the coastal zone? 
Uh, the important terms will include exchange with the atmosphere, aerial, and lateral exchange between all of the reservoirs. What's the magnitude of internal transformation, such as primary production, respiration, and calcium carbonate precipitation and dilution? And how has the carbon budget of the coastal zone changed over in the industrial area? Next slide. Here's a paper that was referred to already by Renier et al. It's a very nice synthesis paper of the land ocean aquatic continuum, including coastal waters. There's also a very nice summary paper published in the same year by Bauer et al. And I won't go through this in detail. And um, the treatment of marshes here is a little bit, a little bit odd. Um, it's sort of blended in with estuaries. Um, but you, I'll direct your attention to the stars there, which gives some assessment of the confidence range. And you can see that only one of them, that is the riverine input, um, has a confidence range less than plus or minus uh, 50%. So all of the others are order of plus or minus 100% or greater. So that's one point. The other is that these numbers are, are fairly large and, and we need to pay attention to them as has already been suggested. Many of these numbers would take a single study. For example, the lateral input from tidal wetlands to estuaries is taken from one study in the South Atlantic Bight. Uh, next slide, please. Here's some work we did uh, on one of the few regional carbon budgets coastal carbon budgets that, that have been developed. This is for Eastern North America. And the main point that I'll make about this is that all three regimes, and you can see this in, in Renier's synthesis and Bauer's synthesis as well, is that all three uh, systems, tidal wetlands, estuaries are important in the coastal zone budget. Tidal wetlands are a very tiny area. It's like it's just a fraction of, a, it's order of a percent or so for um, for our study here in Eastern North America. And yet they're very large um, burial, large CO2 uptake, large lateral transfer of, from tidal wetlands to, to estuaries. Next slide. How well do we know the global areas of tidal wetlands and estuaries? Of course, we need to know these if we wanna scale up um, studies, right? It's the first thing we must know is what the area is. This study by Woodwell, which was a groundbreaking study in 1973, um, is still widely cited and it's based on scaling up U.S. areas for these systems based on coastline lengths. Duridal greatly improved the global estuarine area estimation, but in our work comparing with this um, uh, area estimates where we feel we have fairly accurate estimates here uh, along the East Coast for estuaries, we found that Duridal underestimated the areas uh, substantially. So I have some concern ab about that, uh, even though it's been a great advance. Mangrove area is actually well constrained, but salt marsh area varies by an order of magnitude globally. Next slide, please. Uh, I made a first order um, estimate for uh, uh, global carbon uh, burial and estuaries. There actually wasn't any in the Renier um, synthesis. Um, a recent study that we conducted uh, in the US um, uh, gave us a fairly good estimate of burial, and we just scaled this up using the Dura et al. Um, numbers, and we got um, 0.05 to 0.11 uh, petagrams of carbon per year. Next slide. The lateral flux estimate from uh, Renier et al. was based on a single study in the South Atlantic Bight. We did more work on this in Eastern North America to come up with uh, um, an estimate for total carbon export of 400 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And you can see the large range in global tidal marsh area there. Um, but when you combine that with the global mangrove area and you do the scaling up, you get a flux of 0.06 to 0.22 petagrams of carbon per year. So these are substantial fluxes. Next slide, please. So here are my summary points. All three main components of the coastal zone are important. Riverine input, I didn't talk about this in detail, but it's, it's relatively well known. So I'm still concerned about some correlations between concentration and discharge, which are not always accounted for. Um, the uncertainties in the areas of tidal wetlands and estuaries are potentially large, and they'll confound estimates of global carbon fluxes. For shelf waters, as, as Govan pointed out, the air sea flux is relatively, relatively well constrained. But another important term, which is important in this um, natural outgassing and, and river loop, is the burial, and that is not well constrained, and it varies by, I would say, about a factor of five. And many important terms in the coastal zone are, are uh, s such as the net uh, heterotrophy of the coastal zone, which is important in the natural outgassing. 
are determined by difference and therefore have potentially large errors. Well, thanks very much. Great, thank you, Ray. Uh, thanks for, for staying on time. Um, and uh, do we have any clarifying questions before we move on to the next talk? Okay, we'll have Jessica give her presentation and then we'll have questions at the end. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I introduced myself earlier, but I'll do so again. I'm Jessica Cross. I work for NOAA PMEL, uh, and I've been invited to this workshop today to talk about some coastal ocean issues in the Arctic. Uh, I want to take a moment to say that this is a daunting. Um, the Arctic is a wildly variable place, and I spend the vast majority of my time working on one small section of it, uh, and it has been a real pleasure to dive into the work uh, that this community is doing um, uh, all the way on the other on the Atlantic side of the Arctic, uh, as well as the folks who are really trying to do some pan Arctic syntheses. Uh, so there's you're going to see a lot of citations and references in this talk uh, that reference other people's work uh, and uh, very few of my own actually. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, I want to start out by highlighting a really excellent paper um, by Manfredi uh, that came out just last year that is a really great pan-Arctic synthesis. Um, I took some data from one of the tables that he published in this paper and just plotted it in this bar chart uh, at left over here to show you how wildly variable um, estimates of the Arctic carbon dioxide sink are at the basin scale. Uh, so if we think about all of the coastal seas and all of the Arctic basins together, um, what do we actually know about the Arctic CO2 sink? Well, we do know that it's a sink. And that's about where we can stop. Uh, we're getting much better at being able to scale the order of magnitude. Um, some early estimates of the Arctic CO2 sink indicated that it was on the order of about 60 teragrams of carbon uh, per year, um, but we realized some early mistakes uh, with the way that we were calculating the area of the Arctic Ocean and what got included and what didn't get included and how we handle sea ice, uh, and we've actually scaled that up to somewhere between 116 and 100, uh, 140, 150 um, teragrams of carbon per year. While this may seem small relative to other basins based on the area of the Arctic Ocean, the the, the Arctic is punching above its weight class. Um, it's about 4% of the actual total area of the global oceans, but accounts for somewhere between 5 and 10% of the global carbon sink. Uh, so in addition to having this uncertain baseline, uh, even though we know it is an efficient sink, uh, we also don't know what's going on up there. Uh, you may have heard in the national news that there's been some sea ice loss, um, some really high sea surface temperatures, and some rapid changes. Uh, various estimates have been made regionally for trying to understand how the global carbon or how the Arctic Ocean carbon sink is changing. Um, a handful indicate that it's somewhere between one and 4% per year. Some people say it's growing, some people say it's shrinking. Um, some wild estimates say that it's growing by about 20% per year uh, and still others say that it's stable. Uh, next slide, please. But overall, this can be broken down in essentially two competing narratives. Um, the folks that say that the uh, Arctic carbon sink is increasing because the biological pump is accelerating. Effectively, as sea ice retreats, uh, we allow more light uh, into the Arctic Ocean, and that light is prompting more phytoplankton growth. Uh, I'm highlighting here some uh, images from Karen Fry at left. Uh, the warm colored plot is showing the difference in um, sea ice persistence across the Arctic Ocean Basin. And on the right is the difference in uh, phytoplankton growth as me measured by satellites. Um, the bar charts on the right hand side show essentially the same thing from a different study uh, conducted by Kevin Arrigo. Uh, at top, um, that's the mean open water area per year. Uh, and at bottom, that is the amount of uh, net primary production as measured by satellites per year. So there's some evidence for the fact that maybe this biological pump is accelerating. Maybe we'll see a greater drawdown of carbon dioxide in the Arctic Ocean as a result of the sea ice area loss. Next slide, please. On the other hand, a lot of other people disagree. 
Uh, there is also some evidence to suggest that the Arctic carbon sink is shrinking, and as it shrinks, it is also rapidly filling. Um, this is based on the work of a number of people, but I'll highlight here um, a 2010 paper by Wei Jun Kai on the left, uh, which essentially this plot is showing is that as firm as ice melt creates this firm shallow surface layer uh, that's highly stratified and really difficult to break down uh, that shallowing of the surface layer is literally shrinking the surface of the carbon sink or the uh, is literally shrinking the Arctic carbon sink. Um, however, this model uh, that he included in this 2010 paper shows that as that layer warms, uh, it also fills relatively quickly. Um, and so these blue lines and red lines are essentially showing the difference in speed of when you fill this seasonal carbon sink. On the right hand side, I'm showing some basin scale estimates that come from a recent paper released just this year. Uh, by Woolsey and Malero uh, that is showing based on the GLODAP v2 data set uh, that there really hasn't been that much change in the total amount of carbon uh, in both the Canada Basin and the Makarov Basin. Uh, effectively, what they are showing is that there's some evidence that uh, freshwater content overrides the influence of glass gas exchange. Uh, effectively, you're diluting the total alkalinity uh, here. And so, uh, you know, as you absorb carbon, you're overriding that signal uh, for a net absorption of PCO2 or a net increase in PCO2 of about zero. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's a really simplistic way of trying to tell this story, though. Uh, they, the paper that I highlighted earlier by Manfredi um, is uh, is essentially about these burst rates that when we have really rapid declines in sea ice loss, as we had in 2007, that can trigger this massive, um, this massive drawdown of carbon dioxide into the Arctic Ocean. That maybe when we have more moderate, uh, a more moderate sea ice cycle, uh, that process is not necessarily so true. So depending upon the scale over which you're looking at this problem, you may see extremely high drawdown rates or extremely moderate drawdown rates. Um, I also highlighted this in my intro slide, but I'll say one more time that uh, this isn't just true for phytoplankton blooms, it's also true for upwelling. Uh, and so a number of papers have been released lately that show that maybe we are coughing uh, all of this carbon dioxide that we suck up over the continental shelves through primary production right back out into the atmosphere again uh, as our upwelling events increase. Um, and so maybe we're balancing this increase in uh, primary production with this increase in outgassing from upwelling. Next slide, please. Uh, I had a slide in here about sea ice, uh, but there aren't any charts on it. So I am just going to talk uh, for myself uh, before I get right in here. Um, one of the other things that we need to make room for when we're making room for complexity uh, is understanding air sea fluxes through ice. Um, when we look at laboratory studies that just form and melt ice in the laboratory in a really confined setting, uh, it sort of looks like ice should be a carbon sink during the shoulder seasons, whether ice is melting or whether ice is freezing, um, but that ice itself may be a weak source while the ice matrix is stable. That's based on the work of Tyson, Shaw, and Kotovich. Uh, but when we actually go out and we try to measure this in the field, things get crazy. Um, the speed of freezing and melt seems to make a difference to how much total alkalinity content is actually in the ice matrix and how that influences the piston velocity and the Ravel factor of sea ice. Um, the role of snow cover can also be wildly complex. I'm not even going to try to tell you uh, whether that slows or speeds the carbon sink or changes its sign. Um, we also don't necessarily understand that much about sea ice plankton and bacteria, whether that plankton, whether that plankton is growing in the ice matrix or under the ice matrix as a part of under ice blooms. Um, and all of these in situ observations that we make, we tend to make from stable ice platforms. Uh, and so understanding the role of the marginal ice zone where you're getting all of this very messy melting and refreezing and, and phytoplankton blooms and upwelling and mixing is, is, can be really complex. Uh, so when we talk about key gaps, you know, 
part of the reason that we have these uncertain baselines and we don't know whether the sink is growing or shrinking is because data coverage in time and space is really sparse. Um, we don't have a lot of winter observations. We don't have a lot of under ice observations. And when we conduct these small process studies to try to identify these mechanisms, uh, because we have so little data, those process studies can be really difficult to scale. Um, on top of that, we have so little data that estimates of uh, anthropogenic CO2 and the actual absorption of this anthropogenic CO2 from the atmosphere are really rare. Uh, we're starting to see some of those roll in right now, uh, but we certainly don't have them uh, at the regional and sub-regional scale the same way we do in some of the other coastal ocean basins. Um, these could be wildly different depending upon the subarctic coastal sea that you're talking about and what season you have collected the data in. Uh, so for example, I would argue that the autumn coastal sink in the Beaufort Sea is probably a CO2 source. I don't know what it is on the annual scale, uh, whether there's enough primary production there um, to balance that out or whether that would tip it over on the annual scale to outgassing. Uh, next slide, please. Jessica, you need to wrap it up. Yep. Uh, so now what? Uh, if we are going to talk about carbon dioxide um, or if we are going to talk about synthesis and understanding Arctic CO2 fluxes, um, I would argue that one of the things we need to do first um, is really put lay the gas on quantifying this Arctic carbon dioxide Anthropogenic carbon dioxide regionally, um, I think there's an opportunity here to make really smart use of uh, Earth system models in the absence of this data. Uh, and we also need to explore options for scaling these small process studies uh, to rates and volumes that can be used by these Earth system models to make estimates of the Arctic carbon sink. And that'll wrap it up for me. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Um, we have a few minutes and I, um, Heather, did you have, you want to go to questions from the attendees? Did you have any that you want to bring forward? Um, I've been sending them to you individually if they were from the last session, the open ocean session. Um, I know that Wiley Evans had a question for Gouvant about how the coastal ocean is defined. Um, I, I saw, I saw a question about that. Uh, so the in um, in my project, uh, the coastal ocean does not include estuaries. It's really just the continental shelf because even if quarter degree uh, resolution is an improvement, I mean most estuaries are obviously much smaller than that, so uh, it does not include estuaries. So. Gulva, then do you have any idea as to how the land uh, budget then would intersect with what you've, you're presenting? Uh, just so basically, would the land estimates include those sections or uh, the tidal wetlands of the estuaries, or are we just leaving them out? Do you know? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it depends on the. I think estuaries needs to need to be uh, treated. Uh, uh, I mean, they, they all obviously need to be treated as well, but uh, I, uh, they are discontinuous system, uh, obviously. So it's uh, it's much more difficult to to uh, to account for them. I mean, you need to, but I I don't think it's the the proper tool for that. Actually, I, I mean, I, I've been working a little bit on that, but using a totally different approach with like a modeling tools and uh, like a generic history model that you could uh, apply much more easily along the stretch of course but that's a totally different uh, different approach i have a couple questions here from ray najar that um, are certainly relevant to this coastal block of talks we had uh, one of them is for nikki about how are rivers treated in the hindcast models and then i have another one after she answers that uh, that's a good question. Actually, I don't know exactly the answer to it, Ray. Um, I would guess that they are not treated in the Hindcast models, but I would have to go back and read um, the protocol for um, the OMIP. And Judith Half will know for sure for the global carbon budget Hindcast models. But for OMIP, I would have to go back and reread the protocol. Okay. We had a question for Lore about isn't the river loop different from interhemispheric transport? They seem to be equated. And he's 
she actually addressed the question right here in the chat. So I think everybody can see that. No, I think it's only the panelists, but panelists. I can say it quickly. It's, uh, it's, um, so you're right, river does, any, river loop does not equal hemispheric asymmetry. Uh, however, rivers contribute a large proportion to the asymmetry, about uh, more 15 to 25, 0 0.15 to 0 0.25 of current per year, probably, uh, because of the land distribution more towards the northern hemisphere. Um, and if you go through the possible source of uncertainty that could explain why we, some products would underestimate the asymmetry or our models would underestimate the asymmetry, rivers are a very good candidate. And it's kind of a, my assumption is that they are very good candidate because the uncertainties are huge. Um, and the prior number that the ocean community was using is much lower than what the river community is now, you know, putting out. So other, there are other things that could explain uh, some asymmetry, like uncertainty in the anthropogenic fluxes that we use to compute the pre-industrial or skin effect, skin temperature effects or things like this. But to me, the river was like the most likely candidate. And the point that I was trying to make at the end is that um, with Pierre Renier, we are revising a global bottom-up estimates using your estimates and others. Um, to, and it seems to back up that indirect heat-based top-down constraint, which is a top-down constraint. And can I say about the OMIP, the, the previous question, it will depend on the carbon model in the different models. I don't know about all of them, but basically some of them have no river, some of them have some river that balance the burial. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not consistent across the board. Can I, can I follow up with a question? My yeah, please go ahead, Ray. Uh, and it's just, yeah, this is for Laura. So, how do we? How is this? You say that um, rivers contribute a significant proportion of the asymmetry, um, and is that is that based on ocean model simulations? So yeah, that's yeah. You're right. So this is hard to get a real number, but basically what I used is some um, simulations that were done a while ago where they changed the river input and calculated how much of the river, depending where you, how it was transported and uh, from, the um, from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. Right. So yes, you're right. Olivier Oman's, yeah. uh, Oman's work? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah. right. Good stuff. We have another question from Patrick Krill in the Arctic. How does increased storminess play against ideas such as increased surface stratification stability related to the Kai? Sure. Uh, so it's complicated is how I would argue about that. Um, I think that uh, overall, this increased storminess is going to have a much greater effect at the coast, uh, where you can use that storminess to essentially increase this coastal upwelling. Uh, whereas when you're talking about, you know, maybe the large scale, um, you know, Canada Basin and, and way out into the basin where you have uh, fewer storms and this really tight, nice layer, uh, even the storms that you do get are really uh, it's a challenging to break down that ice layer, or that ice melt layer. Okay, well, it's 1.35 and we promise everybody a 15 minute lunch break at this time. So uh, let's go ahead. Um, sorry, we said a 25 minute actually uh, break. Uh, so, um, wow, we were generous. So um, let's go, uh, let's have our break and come back at two o'clock Eastern uh, to talk about synthesis and observational programs. Um, and uh, thanks everyone from be for being here for the, the first session and I hope people will stick with us for the afternoon.